Hi, and welcome to episode 75 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. I'm Heidi Parker. I'm a postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin. Hi, I'm Tom Paisley, and I'm a person at the University of Cambridge in England. <laughs> That's good. And like I said, this is Breaking Bio, and we've got some exciting news before we get into our guest for the first guest for 2015, is that uh, we've somehow secured funding, outreach funding, from the European Society for Evolutionary Biology, and uh, we want to make sure that we give them a shout-out and a thanks for, for helping us keep the lights on, both figuratively and, in Heidi's case, not so much literally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've got the, a little bit of business out of the way, Let's introduce our first guest, like I said, of 2015, who is Dr. Dieter Lucas, who is a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Dieter. Thanks for joining us. And you want to tell everybody at home a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I'm interested in why species differ so much and how individuals interact with each other. And then what consequences that has for other aspects of their life and for how adaptation has shaped their bodies and other aspects of how they actually live their lives. So I'm interested in the evolution of social systems and then how these social systems affect the mating system of species, their social behavior, and then how that can actually have effects on lots and lots of other things afterwards. And I'm currently, as you said, in Cambridge, where I'm focusing with Professor Tim Clattenbrock on the evolution of sociality in mammals. So I have data on several hundred species of mammals. I didn't collect that myself in the field. I actually don't go to the field myself. All the data I collect is in the library and on a computer. So my field work is in the library. So I spend a few years actually going through what other people have been writing about these species, which can be interesting and fun and bizarre. <laughs> and now what I'm trying to see is whether there are patterns. Is it something where you know all those species that have a certain type of behavior do they all live in the same environment? Do they all eat the same food? Or what's common about those? And then trying to reconstruct in the past when those changes occurred and what might have happened since. So on a, on a practical aspect, it seems like that must be quite daunting to spend a lot of your time going through other people's work in the hope that you're going to find interesting patterns from that. So how did you cope with, uh, with that during your PhD? So in... During my PhD, I started already looking at comparative stuff, but I mean, first during my PhD, I was actually still in the lab. I did paternity and related analyses using microsatellite data, so genetic data to understand for chimpanzees and gorillas who fathers the offspring and then how are the individuals in the group related. But when I started that in the lab where I was working, everybody in the lab was studying different species. There were people studying lots of different monkeys, lots of different apes, and lots of different populations. We had a weekly lab meeting where people would just present that and you could just hear somebody describing something. That's when I first became interested. Okay, can we actually see a pattern in the data where, you know, in gorillas you have a harem where there's a single male, many females. So are all the offspring really then sired by that male? Whereas in the chimpanzees, many males, they all mate with the females. And is it then that the offspring aren't that related? So that I first became interested in really interacting with this, these people and then that large scale, what I'm doing now, I started that once I switched to Cambridge and did my postdoc there. And it is interesting trying to find, yeah, that data and that literature. I mean, you can start with just going through encyclopedias. You have a first, like this, the Walker's Encyclopedia of Mammals. And it's a really big set of books, and you can just start with that, and it's a great starting point. But then, yes, I think you always have to go back to the primary literature. And I think the final step is really just as well talking to the people. And it's, it's, I mean, like, it's challenging in the sense that as well, I guess most of you know that as well, that people use different terms for the same thing. So you have to actually understand, do they really mean what they're saying there? Or is it actually something different? And then trying to find the definition that it can actually apply to lots of different species. But yeah, I mean, it's on the other side, you know, we always complain that we don't have enough time to read. And basically, you know, my job is to be able to just read. You know, I, that's, I have the time to do that. And it's great to be, you know, reading the latest papers and being on top and trying to see what's happening out there. 
Um, so you, you had a really nice paper recently in Science, um, and you were talking earlier about you know the uh, bringing together behaviours and uh, morphological traits and physiology. And there was stuff about, so you were looking at the evolution of infanticide, and that comes in with female promiscuity and sperm competition. So can you tell us a little bit about this? So yeah, we were interested in this one behavior where males go in and kill all the offspring in a new group they just entered. And, you know, classical examples of the lions where, you know, they have these coalitions of males, they get access to a troop of females, and then they really just go in and seek out all the offspring and kill them. And so it's a very predictable behavior in that sense. It's not just a sudden male freaks out and, you know, kills an offspring. And it occurs in quite a lot of species, probably 30 to 40 percent of all mammals. And so like you said, yeah, we were trying to see how that links with the mating behavior and other aspects. And what we found is that it happens when it first evolves, so it first starts to happen when males can really dominate reproduction. So when you have that one big male that defends exclusively a group of females where they then sire all the offspring, and that means when a new male comes in, he knows he hasn't sired any of the offspring previously because reproduction before was the other male. So there's no risk that he actually will kill his own offspring. And what's the other thing in these systems is if you have that system where one male defends these females, there's lots and lots of males around who so also try to get to those females. And they constantly fight that male and get access to those groups, which means that that male who has them, usually it's in there for only a very short time. And so in order to make the most of that time, by killing the previous offspring, females will become pregnant sooner. And so that's a benefit for that male to make the most of that short time he has in that group. And as you said, we were interested in, can females actually prevent that behavior? Is there something that females can do to stop that? Because it's a pretty high cost losing your offspring every few years. And so what we actually found is really that change then in the morphological trait, the change in testes size. So over time in those lineages where males kill offspring, we could see that testes sizes increase. And then as testes sizes get really large, then actually infanticide is being lost. And what we know from other research is that testes size is a pretty good indicator with how many males of females mates. So if a female mates with more than one male, the males now compete basically inside the female. And the way to compete inside the female is to produce more and more sperm. So you can actually you know, win the lottery that your sperm is the one that sires the offspring. And so what we see in those lineages is that females start to mate with more and more and more males. And once they start with mating so, with so many males, they probably a male doesn't know whether he is the father or not, then they will stop killing the offspring. And so we can actually see there the link between yeah, the mating system, the behavior, and then as well the morphology. You can actually see something in the body, the testes getting bigger and bigger and bigger once the behavior is there. Uh, do you see any general trends, right? Because infanticide is this general concept. So you can have infanticide by females, infanticide by males, related or unrelated of both sexes. Do you see any trends coming up for anything else besides the unrelated males? Um, so the, so we, well, the first study, we only looked at infanticide by males. So when do males kill offspring? And what we really found is they usually kill offspring that aren't their own. And it really seems to be there that clear then strategy for the males to maximize their reproductive success in the short time they have. When we were collecting the data, we also collected the data on occurrences of other types of infanticide. So, I mean, people have looked quite a bit at when females kill their own offspring, and that seems to be linked to times when there are low resources. So when it's actually best in that sense, if there isn't enough food available at the moment to have enough both for the offspring and for the mother, then it's the best if the mother tries to survive and produce offspring in the future. So that's when they might actually kill and eat their own offspring. But what also happens is that females kill each other's offspring. And that's what we're looking at now. So we collected the data, and the first thing we saw, it's actually not linked to when males kill offspring. So I mean, one idea could have been it's just really, again, linked to food. So both males and females, whenever they need a snack, it's going to kill an offspring of somebody else and eat it. But then we would have expect that it happens in the same species that males and females kill offspring. That's not what we see. So female infanticide, females killing each other's offspring, is independent of male infanticide. And so we're now in trying to look at, okay, what explains this competition between females? And we're starting to see some predictors of that as well. It really seems to be this old idea that usually females in mammals compete about resources, 
whereas males compete about females. So the, in order to get the most offspring for the females, because they have to invest into pregnancy and lactation, they really compete over food. And that's what we're starting to see is in these species where females really have the potential to actually monopolize food, or there's some food that they can then have for themselves, that's potentially then where they might kill each other's offspring so that they get the food for themselves. And when you have uh, a female that has a litter, when you have infanticide that happens with the litter, does the female usually eat the entire litter or just a few? Is that kind of a gross question? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, if, yeah. you, if there were limited resources and you had six right. babies, why not eat three of them? Yes, right? and that seems to be the case. And um, it, I think that's more in birds, actually, where people have shown that quite a few bird species, the female might just lay an extract just as an insurance. I'm not that shitty stuff happens to the first egg. Then the second one, which is usually smaller and a smaller chick, then that one will get killed and potentially eaten. And that's probably also what you see in those species where females kill their own offspring in the mammals, that yes, they probably won't necessarily start eating the whole litter. They might just start, you know, with the smallest, weakest one, and then work their way up depending on how hungry they still are. Um, whereas when they kill each other's offspring, they're really going to kill the whole litter. So that's okay. really then excluding any kind of competition, really going through and killing all the other offspring that are around. And the interesting thing there is that females actually will usually only do it when they're still pregnant themselves. And that's both true for what people have been describing in birds and in mammals. So when they're pregnant, that's when they become really aggressive. And that's then when they will kill somebody who has just produced offspring, another female has produced offspring, they will kill either throw out the eggs if they're a bird or eat or kill the offspring if they're a mammal. Once they started to have their own first offspring, they will stop. And that's probably because, again, they can't tell whether any offspring they're not going to kill in this communal nest or in the communal breeding area is going to be theirs or somebody else's. And that seems to be a physiological change. They've so done experiments with birds where they you know, took away all the eggs that were in the nest so the bird could see, hey, there isn't any egg left. So any new egg that comes has to be from somebody else. They're still not going to throw that egg out because they thought I already laid an egg. This could be mine. The hormones might have changed. So there is a hormonal mechanism that to stop a female once she has given birth from killing other offspring unless she really needs the food. <laughs> That's fairly complicated. Um, so I think I think you said that like between forty and sixty percent of mammals practice infanticide in some form or another. Am I right on that number? It's so it's um, so in the data we had it was forty percent of all the species where the males kill the offspring. Okay, it's probably yeah. around the same percentage of females that kill offspring. Okay. There's a slight problem there in that we usually, it's, if, when I went through the literature, it's quite interesting to see where we actually have information. And for example, for the mammals, there's very little information on bats. They're nocturnal, you know, they fly, so you can't really easily study them. So most species where we have data are species that live during the day, are large, and usually live in groups because they're fascinating, they're interesting, you can get many individuals at once. And right. so it, what we actually see is like it's much more common in group living species infanticide than in solitary species. So it could actually be that overall the percentage is slightly lower because we mainly have data for the group living species and it's more common in group living species. So if you then look across all mammals, if we were to some point ever get data on all the mammals, it could be slightly lower than that even. Right. So, so that, uh, that kind of follows up my question, whereas um, I think most people, when they think of this sort of infanticide, or at least the male-directed infanticide, um, they think of lion prides and such, which I think have been the, the, the golden child of baby killing um, in the mammal world. Uh, <laughs> many, many thanks because of nature documentaries that generally yeah. show it in graphic detail. Um, yeah. So many people may not realize that it's more of a widespread practice than that, even if you're saying we have limited data on some groups. But uh, can you give an idea of you know, what other groups may be practicing infanticide of, of some sort? So I mean, other well-known species would, for example, be horses. Um, so in the horses as well, they have this harem system where you have the one male that tries to get all the females to him, defends these females, and a new male coming in will actually, this, 
different ways how it can kill the offspring. Again, I mean, it shows that it's not just carnivores. You know, we always always think as well that like killing is something that only carnivores, like lions with their big teeth, do. But now we have a horse, and they might either kick the offspring, or they might just harass it so much that it can't get enough milk, and then will simply starve to death. So it's actually a bit more brutal, even if you think about it, in the way that the offspring now has to die in these species. So horses would be an example. I mean, it, it occurs in quite a few rodent species as well. It might occur in house mice. So people have been suggesting as well that house mice, the males and the females as well, there will kill offspring. So it's not linked to their diet even, and it's really widespread in all these different systems. And hmm. I know yeah. it occurs in lab mice because it's a horrible thing. You go to check your box of mice and the mom's got blood all over her face. And it's horrible. <laughs> yes. But obviously... Yeah. We're not breeding lab mice for maternal behavior, right? It's almost been, you know, it's like litter size and things like that. So it's almost been outbred for maternal behavior. But when you compare lab mice to, you know, house mice or field mice or whatever, do you, do you expect to see differences? Yeah, I do expect to see differences from what people have been describing. It's, I mean, um, when I did my undergrad, I worked with some people who were studying guinea pigs. And they were saying it's amazing how quickly these individuals change their behavior once you bring them in the lab and even have them just for a few generations there. And I mean, part of that is that you're probably going to have these bottleneck effects. So that's one issue. We just take a small subset that you randomly manage to catch somewhere. And they're probably already the stupid individuals because you managed to catch them, right? So <laughs> you bring them into the lab, just breed them among themselves for a few generations. So they're going to show behavior that might not necessarily be representative of what you find out in the wild. But I mean, I, th I still think they're going to give us some clues, and I still think, I mean, a behavior like infanticide, I mean, if we're coming back to some extent about the question then whether behavior such as infanticide is really like manifest as a genetic fixed behavior that every individual will always express once the circumstances are right, or whether it's more flexible to the extent that there's a tendency that is determined by your genes for showing the behavior, and then depending on the experience you have while you grow up, and then as well the situation you find yourself when you're an adult, that determines whether you kill an offspring or not. And it's probably the latter. I mean, that's what we know as well. I mean, there's some people now that have been shown, like in gorillas, we usually see infanticide as well. But now in the mountain gorillas, these populations in the Barungas, which are like small populations of 350 individuals where they can't go anywhere else, groups have become bigger and bigger and bigger. And they have now become bigger and bigger as well that multiple males are in the groups who now all might mate with the females. And as soon as that happens, we see infanticide stopping. So it's not just something that takes several generations for infanticide being lost. You know, these individuals who, if they were in a different group, would kill offspring, now stop the behavior. So it's a really flexible behavior. So I still think that, yes, there's a genetic tendency. And I still think that then, yes, if you have these individuals in the lab, their behavior is clearly reflecting something that they have been selected for in the wild. And as well, like, there is a tendency for that. I mean, there was all that debate initially when infanticide was first discovered. That was the same time when people actually first had lab mice and found that behavior in the lab mice. And then everybody said, hey, it's a completely pathological behavior because we see it in lab mice and they are pathological. So anything you see in the wild is likely going to be pathological as well. And then it took like the heroic effort of Sarah Bluffa Hardy to actually go out and really study the behavior in detail and say, like, look, we can clearly say in the wild this isn't pathological. We can say this has a benefit for a male to do the behavior. He does it strategically. It's clearly adapted. So we can actually say now, look, it's probably also then what we saw in the lab. It's not necessarily just pathological. It's probably true. It's triggered by a situation that might not be nat natural like the high density, the stress, might be a trigger to set off the behavior. So maybe when the behavior occurs doesn't tell us anything about the wild, but the fact that maybe some, only some species show it if you take them to a lab and others don't, still tells us about something about the evolutionary history. So I think I read something a little while ago that um, infanticide had been suggested as a driver of the evolution of uh, social monogamy. But you've, you've had a paper recently that said maybe that isn't the case. Can you tell us a bit about that as well? Right. So the idea is exactly that um, So social monogamy is a system where you have a pair, one male and one female, living together in an area. And in quite a few species, then as well, what you see is that the male will help out the female, raising the offspring. 
And there are different forms how he can do that. He can, like, you know, protect against predators, or he can protect against other males that might kill the upspring, or he can really help to bring food and, you know, bring shelter and everything that for the upspring. And because there's this close link where males in mammals especially usually only help if they're actually monogamous, so you don't see these behaviors necessarily in any other species, people have said, okay, maybe that's why monogamy evolved, because, you know, you need the male there to either help to feed the offspring or help protect against other males that might kill the offspring. And so what you would then predict is that if you actually try to reconstruct when did monogamy evolved, and that's what we did, so we had the data for two and a half thousand species, Quite a few of them are monogamous, and you can actually see, okay, if two species are monogamous, they're closely related, probably their ancestor was already monogamous. So you can see, okay, when in the past does this happen? And then you can do the same for infanticide. You can say, okay, all these species in the clade have infanticide, so all carn you know, all felids, all cats have infanticide, so probably it was present in their common ancestor. Um, and so you can say, okay, this is when it evolved. Was it now before monogamy evolved? Or did that happen after monogamy was there? What we usually found is that the presence of infanticide had no influence of whether species would become monogamous or not. So rejecting this idea that, yes, you have this strong pressure once there is infanticide to become monogamous. And we also found lots and lots of instances where monogamy evolved, even though it's very unlikely that the males would ever kill the offspring. So suggested that no, there's no link in that sense that infanticide drives the evolution of social monogamy. And instead what we found is that social monogamy evolves when females compete over food. So when females can build up territories to defend exclusive rights to fruiting trees or herds of prey, then they will become so widely spaced and don't tolerate any other female close by that a single male can't get access to more than one female. And then it's best to just stick with that female, try to have all her offspring, rather than trying to go out and search for another female which you might not find. And that's the situation we think explains best why monogamy evolved in mammals. So uh, I know that in birds, but, uh, when you get social monogamy, there's, it's quite often there's lots of extra pair mating. Is that the same in mammals, or is it different? It's the same. So it's... It's, it's lower on average than what you would see in a bird, so I think the average in birds, what people have now been describing, is around maybe 20% of the offspring are sired by a male outside. But there are surprisingly quite a few species where actually there is extreme faithfulness. So in mammals, I think it's lower than 10% in the monogamous species that all the offspring are sired by a male that's outside. Um, and again, there might be variation depending on how strict monogamy is actually enforced. I mean, in most of species, again, like I said before, males will try to get as many off females as they can. So there might be variation, and maybe sometimes a male has more than one female, and then he can't defend them perfectly. Whereas in other species, they're really close to each other, and the male is really always there and defends the female. But in mammals, so there is, there is to some extent, extra pair paternity, but it's much lower than what we observe in birds. So you've said that you're kind of trapped in the library reading all these, you know, reviews and going through all this sort of metadata. But if you could go and see infanticide in one of these species that you study, which one would you pick? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I mean, so one thing is I've been lucky enough that I've always been the only person doing these kinds of studies, and which means I always get to go to the field set of what everybody else studies. So I went to Rwanda and Uganda to see chimpanzees and gorillas. Now currently I work with everybody who studies meerkats. So I've been to the Kalahari to see the meerkats. I've been to Scotland to see the deer study site out there. But in terms of infanticide, I think just hearing from the story, I mean, one of the craziest system I've heard is actually from the collaborator that I had that publication with, Elise Houchard. And she works on chakma baboons. And she says there the situation is so crazy that really more than half of all offspring get killed by infanticide. Because the males really just go into the group, go out, go into the group, and it's, it's just crazy if you think about it. It's like, you know, we think of high mortality rates of offspring because they might be starving or have diseases, but the thing that half of all offspring that are born are killed by other males, it just sounds like such a fran frantic system, just a crazy system. I think that would be interesting to see, just how that all plays out and how the males are constantly fighting and all that. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> 
That's, like, yeah, that's incredible. What's yeah. the, I wonder what the gestation is, if there's a relationship between the number of kills and gestation time. So, yeah, I mean, there's a relationship between gestation time and how long the males are in the group. And so the gestation time is real, it's over a year still. So it's actually, and the interbirth interval can be up to two years. It's a really long period. Wow. If the males can only stay in the group for two years or less, that's, yeah, they have to kill the offspring in order to at least maybe get one offspring in the short time they have in there. Wow. Um, yeah. Jesus. That makes you question how those populations are even... <laughs> Functioning. Yeah, that's sustainable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Um, okay, so with that morbid thought, um, <laughs> so humans are a fairly messy species, and they're also fairly, uh, you know, you know, they really like to hear about the monogamy versus not so much monogamy debates. Yeah. Um, do you factor humans into these meta analyses that you're doing? Perhaps not so much the infanticide one. I don't know if that's <laughs> kosher. But. No, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact, right? Stepfathers are more likely to kill their children than biological fathers. <laughs> no, um, it's true. It, yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot to that. Yes, and exactly. Yes. Um, so, I usually don't include humans, and there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, one reason is like you said with the messy. I mean, it's not messy. Also, just means that there's so much variation if you look across human cultures and human societies. In like, you know, is monogamy really the dominant system? I mean, it seems to be if you count people. It also now, some people argue, if you count societies, but we don't really yet know, you know, whether that can, I mean, the thing is for these comparative analysis, I just put a species into one box. I say this species is monogamous, stop. And I usually take a definition where I say, look, if you know, if most reports say that more than half of all the individuals do that behavior, that's when I put them in the box. And usually what we have in animals is that if you actually see these different people, will start calling them different species, right? You know, they behave differently, they're different species. Whereas in humans, we have all this variation. It would be very difficult to define it for some behaviors. You know, is there a human universal? And if so, what is it? And then the other issue is, with these reconstructions I'm trying to do, it's like um, with humans, we're also not sure how often our behavior has changed. For example, people are arguing that maybe agriculture had had a huge influence on our behavior. So if I now try to see what was the common ancestor with bonobos and chimpanzees, okay, do I t take what you do today in Western societies? Other people have been arguing maybe we should just looking at hunter-gatherers. But you know, then you think about it, but hunter-gatherers has at, had as much time to change than had Western societies. And because we have all that variation, and because we have culture, which introduces additional element that can lead to changes, I'm not quite sure whether we can really put humans into one category. That's one of the reasons why I've included, excluded them. And then as well, like with infanticide, I'm, yes, we have these observations that uh, children are more likely to die in these situations where, you know, the father is a stepfather than the other father. But again, we don't quite know whether these are also the families that are inherently more unstable. I don't think people have necessarily always controlled for that. You know, you're more likely to get divorced potentially if you live in a certain situation, more you're likely to take on a new... So is it really those other social circumstances in humans that make it more likely that a child will die in such a family than something else? So I'm not entirely sure to what extent that behavior is really, again, then similar to this really adaptive behavior we observe in the animals where, you know, the new male comes in, he seeks out all the offspring, he kills them. You know, I don't think we have that. I mean, Sarah Hardy said that as well when she was quoted in one of the comments. I was like, you don't see that a male runs around with a knife, you know, as soon as he mates with a new woman trying to kill all the offspring. So, you know, I, it's difficult to say whether behavior is really then comparable in that sense, you know. <laughs> I was wondering whether you're also staying away from humans because uh, you, you already get quite a lot of press attention for the work that you've been doing because you you know you're in mammals and looking at death and sex. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, is there has there been a particular uh, mainstream media interpretation of your work that you've enjoyed or banged your head against the wall about? No, I mean, so actually, I actually went through this recently. I put it on my website now as well, just trying to get through my ways of what, how did I interact with the press, what, you know, did I think there. So, there, I mean, yes, people do write stupid things and people do write things like, you know, you, you know, humans take heart, you know, also animals kill their offspring, you're like, I don't think we ever meant that, you know, it's like, <laughs> um, 
I think it's, I mean, it's, I think the things I still find interesting, and I, I mean, what I know come to realize, what, one of the questions, for example, with all the influence, I, very few people actually ask me about humans, and most people seem to be just, like you said, interested in, like, hey, blood and violence, and, you know, sex and violence, and animals. Um, so, one thing that I saw, which I always then try to contract, is this idea that, you know, what we briefly mentioned with the baboons, that 50% of the offspring die, how can that be good for the species? You know, why should the male show this behavior if it isn't good for the species? Or now females can do something against it that's going to rescue the species. And that's, you know, an idea that is very prevalent still, and to some extent it's also sometimes coming back again in the biological scientific literature about group selection, those ideas where people argue that, you know, the behavior is adapted to help the group or the species. And I, I don't think there's any evidence for this. And everything I've seen and everything I think happens is that an individual will try to maximize its own reproductive success. So the male and the baboons will go in and kill the offspring because it's the best for him. You know, he's never going to think or never going to be selected on to do something that's going to help the species. You know, he's only going to do something for another individual if he gets something as a benefit as well, either because there's an immediate benefit if you hunt together or the other individual, you know, if I groom your back, you're going to groom mine. Or maybe because we're family, and so, you know, the genes I carry are also present in you, so there's a benefit of that. So it's sometimes, I mean, that's sometimes just, I think, trying to be clear about this idea that individual actions don't happen for the benefit of a species. They happen because an individual has been selected to get the highest reproductive success. I think that's something which I encounter a lot and which I try to counteract. Um, so I think running out of time here, but and you're obviously doing really cool stuff. Can you tell us what you're what you're working on next? So the one thing, yeah, I'm working on next is looking at when do females kill each other's offspring, which is directly following from what I had there. Um, one other study I'm now trying to look at, people have been arguing that your social interactions might be linked to how smart you have to be, and it could be different things that are linked to that, you know, maybe you need to... If you help each other, you know, that might give you more food, so can you know you can have more energy for developing your brain and sustaining your brain. Or maybe it's just that you need to learn where you are because you're now in a group and you have to pick up things. Or maybe you have to find your position in society. So I want to see, you know, how does social behavior what is it actually about the social world that might lead to larger brains? And then more general, so I mean, yes, we looked at monogamy. We looked at another system, cooperative breeders, which you, where you have a pair that has all the offspring, and then they, everybody helps to raise the offspring. And uh, now we want to look at all these other types of social systems, so that, in general, the like, next step would now be looked at when do females live in stable groups, and which species do individuals live in herds, and what are the factors that explain these other types of social systems. So that would be then to follow on from there, trying to get an as complete picture as we can about all the different types of social systems and social organizations we see in mammals. Cool. Sounds like a lot of exciting work coming up. Um, so we got to wrap it up, like Tom said, but uh, where can people follow along with you and your career and, and all of this uh, stuff that you're working on currently and in the future? Um, so probably the easiest is people just start on Twitter. So I, my name, DJ Lucas, is just my Twitter handle. And then I link from there to my website where I have summaries of my papers and other resources that people might find helpful. Awesome. We'll make sure to have uh, all of that, as well as links to some of the papers that we discussed uh, this week and uh, some other resource resources, perhaps, um, on our website, which is at breakingbio.com. Um, and I also want to remind everybody that you can find us on Twitter at Breaking Bio. You can find us on Facebook by searching for the Breaking Bio podcast. And you can take us with you on iTunes by searching for the Breaking Bio podcast as well. I uh, want to say thanks again to the European Society for Evolutionary Biology for funding us, and we hope you, everybody at home listening will join us again next week when we have a new guest to talk about more biology. Thanks.